Uh, thanks very much to Neil and Cindy and everybody for uh, having me. I did look over, this could hardly be louder. Thank you. Um, I did look over the speakers from the class and it looked like a great array, a real treat. And so congratulations on getting through it. And uh, I, hope, I, I hope there's something left that I can contribute. We'll, we'll try. Um, so before I do this, I want to do a couple of kind of side comments. Uh, things that I just want to tell you about. Uh, three things. That, let me just check out the board here. Okay. This is an awesome. I love it. It's like huge. It goes on forever. Okay, three things. I'll put them over here. Three things. The first thing is that um, this is a, this falls under shameless plug. I have a radio show, and if you're in, if if you are entertained by today's lecture. Go to Stanford Radio, uh, all one word, dot Stanford, dot edu, and you can uh, listen to one of the 70 interviews. I basically, it's called The Future of Everything, and I interview Stanford scientists and engineers about how their work is um, affecting the future, inventing the future. That's why it's called The Future of Everything. And so it's just a fun little thing that I do, and check it out if you're interested. So that's kind of shameless. Less shameless, but relevant to this class is I am the faculty director of something that may have come up in the class, I'm not sure, called the AI100. And there's information about the AI100.stanford.edu there. And this is a really interesting, it's, it, the full name of it is called the 100 year, the 100 year study of artificial intelligence. Uh, and there is a donor who thought it would be a good idea to endow Stanford, so he gave a big donation to Stanford, uh, in exchange for Stanford running a meeting every five years that would lead to a report on progress in AI over that previous five years. And this donor just wants that to happen for at least 100 years. Mm -hmm. So that we can kind of see, because um, it's moving so fast that sometimes when you're in the middle of a river, you don't see how, like, how the river has changed, if it's going faster or slower, if it's taken turns that were unexpected. So um, th there was a meeting in 2009 that was a, not part of AI 100, but that had a really nice result. It, it, was, it looked at the impact of AI on jobs, on healthcare, on military applications, on banking and finance, just across the whole gamut. Uh, this, donor, this donor was very intrigued by that and said, okay, I would like to see this every five years. So we did our first report in 2015-2016. Uh, that was a real fast report. It's perfectly good, but it was fast. Uh, and then there'll be one coming out in the next couple of years. So if you're interested in that, that's a, a very consistent with the themes of this class, but even broader, because it's about all the impacts of AI on society. And then a third thing that I want to just mention is a thing that like happened in the news today in my field, which is a great uh, kickoff for the, I think this talk. So what I'm gonna, on the rest of the board, I'm going to talk about uh, AI in the kinds of areas that I work in, and it'll be hopefully fine and interesting. But um, there is a field of um, of biology called protein structure prediction. which is a pretty specific technical thing, and I'm not going to go into, into detail because I know that some of you don't have a lot of deep molecular biology, some of you are pure computer scientists, that's all fine. But let me just say that since, um, really since 1960, but getting very serious in 1994, there has been a biannual, every two years, meeting of um, computational biologists who want to predict the three-dimensional structure of protein molecules. And if you've ever taken a biology course, even in high school, you might remember that like they have alpha helices and then they loop around in there. Imagine that in 3D. Okay, so there's your 3D. And they're beautiful molecules and they're proteins that are in your body and make all of life work. So the key point is, in today's news, there was an announcement that the Google Mind team uh, blew away the uh, competition. And this is a competition that's been held every two years since 94. So every two years, there's a little bit of progress in 96, 98, 2000. Um, 
they call it, you know, they, they had the alpha go, and so they call this alpha fold, because this is protein structure prediction is predicting how does a protein fold, and so they called it alpha fold. And if you do, if you're on the internet right now, you can just do a search for alpha fold, and they kind of crushed the competition. And they used one of these deep learning methods that I'm sure you've heard about during the course of this quarter. And I'll t I might touch upon it. We have actually similar work, not this exact work, but inspired by some of the same things in our lab. But this is huge. There's been only one other time where a method kind of blew everybody away, and that was in 98, 96 or 98, when <laughs> basically, this all happens by the rules of physics. Uh, and so the early attempts were all attempts to emulate physics in order to get this to be done. And in 1998, some person said, uh, no, forget about physics, let's just use data. And let's have a data-driven method and not a physics-driven method. And he blew everybody away. His name was David Baker. He blew everybody away. And that, then there's been incremental progress for the last 20 years. And then as of yesterday, another huge jump. Like, 33% better. After 2 to 5% increases each year, the, uh, the Google DeepMind team did like a 33% increase in performance. So this is a huge deal, uh, and it's a big, hard problem that many, many smart people have been working on, you know, literally for 50 or 60 years. And so that's an exciting ripped from the headlines. And I'll just let you Google it and learn about it. So now I'll go to my regularly scheduled comments. Is there any questions about any of that? By the way, I know it's a huge empty room, mostly empty. For some reason, way more full on this side than on this side. Um, I am right-handed, so you guys are all going to be benefiting from that, but I'll try to look over here every now and then. Um, and I have focus issues, as you can see, so I'll also try to focus. Um, please do interrupt me with questions. That'll make it much more fun. And, um, I will definitely be able to finish on time. So my understanding is about 40 minutes, and then Q&A. Good. All right. So my view, and you've heard a lot, so I'm just going to tell you my view of AI and healthcare and some stories out of my work, which I can talk about. I know what I'm talking about. There are three big data streams. This is probably all come to your attention. Big data streams that really weren't around uh, 20 years ago that create opportunities for data science and artificial intelligence in healthcare. Let me just say something about healthcare. I think about healthcare in two big buckets. The first bucket is discovery. This is where we discover stuff that might help patients. And then there's implementation, which is this is how we take the discoveries and turn them into things that we actually do to patients. So the discovery is very exciting, but it's often in a lab. It's unproven. It hasn't been validated by the Food and Drug Administration, if it's a device or a diagnostic or a drug. Um, so it's very exciting. It can save millions of lives, but it's not ready for prime time. And then the hard work of bringing it to market or to, or to scale is implementation. And, and I must say, today, I've, in my life, I do some implementation stuff, but a lot of what I'm going to talk about and a lot of what I do day to day is discovery. So, not really apologizing, but just explaining that that's what you might hear a little bit more of. Getting back here to the big three big streams, you could almost guess them, and these are not in any order. The first big data stream is the availability of electronic health records uh, and claims data and all kinds of population data, population health data. Claims data, just to be clear, I don't know if we've talked about it in this class, this is like the administrative data about a doctor saw a patient and coded the patient as having the following diseases uh, and therefore we paid the doctor. So a lot of what we have in the US is based on what doctors have asked to be paid for and we assume that that's true, that the patient really did have diabetes because the doctor wrote, please pay me for diabetes. And we think that it's mostly true, but you can imagine it's only mostly true. It's not perfectly true. Then there's electronic health records, which we have in hospitals and in clinics, where, uh, especially in the last 15 years, there's been a huge uptake, uh, really mandated by some federal uh, initiatives, federal US initiatives, where now 
I think the penetration is 85 or 90 percent of the world has some of the people in the world in the U.S. have electronic health records that records all the details of your health, your lab tests, your X-rays, the notes that your doctor writes about you um, after they see you, uh, and all kinds of uh, and the drugs you're on. That's a big data stream that can be available, certainly for implementation. In fact, it's meant for implementation. But we, academics, can have been figuring out how to use that data for discovery as well. <laughs> the second big data stream is uh, genomics. And really, genomics and molecular medicine. So we have had an unbelievable ability in the last 10 years to measure things about people. And the number one first thing is people's genomes. So your genome, I know you've heard about this a little bit, just based on looking at who's on the, and who has spoke already. But basically, mom and dad each give you about 3 billion DNA bases. So there's four letters, A, uh, A, T, C, and G. And imagine a long, 3 billion long string of letters. That's the genome you get from mom, and then you get another one from dad. Uh, hopefully you get two good copies of every gene. That's one of the, it's kind of like an error correcting mechanism. That's why it wouldn't be good if you just like butted off mom. Like it would be great, but if, if there was an error in like making the copy of mom, then you would have an error. So if you have mom and dad, then they both give you a copy and hopefully at least one of them works. And in fact, in general, almost all of them work. So we can make these measurements and this is highly personal. Every one of your genomes is quite is different. They're very similar, they're 99.7, just to pick a number, similar, but 0.3% of 3 billion is plenty of places in the genome where you're different. And we'd like to understand how those differences affect your health. How the, well, certainly we'd like to understand how they affect your traits, like how tall you are and what color your eyes are, but for me, what's really exciting is what's your risk for disease and what's the likelihood that drugs will work on you? And that's something that we hope to get out of this information, combining it with this stuff. I mean, one of the themes today is going to be is the combination of these streams that's the most exciting. And the third stream is environmental, and I mean that very broadly, sensing. So there are sensors all over. There's video all over. Uh, you know, we're being filmed all the time. There, we have the ability to put little air quality, uh, you know, the air quality detectors have actually been in the news because we've had worse air quality in the last couple of months than, than ever before because of the fires in Northern and Southern California. But I also mean environment, not only uh, in the environment that you're living in, but things like the fingerprints that you leave in the world, like your social media. So that's a little bit of a stretch, but I want to include it because I'm going to tell a story about social media in, in a little while. So this is all the stuff that's not official medical data. It's not official measurements of your physiology through technologies of, an, of, of a biotech. It's everything else about you, the world that you live in, where you go, where you, what you eat, all that, kind of, and then what you say on Instagram and Facebook and Snapchat and Twitter and all that stuff. So those three data streams are the wrist, that's, the, that's what makes AI, especially data intensive AI, very exciting now because in all of these there's unbelievable challenges and unbelievable opportunities, both for discovery and then translating the discovery uh, into things that will impact everybody. Good, so that's my introduction. Everybody, everybody with me? Okay. So now I'm going to take a little detour and tell you about my, a little bit about my work, uh, and then some examples from it. So my specific area of interest is a field called pharmacogenomics, which I'm going to tell you what it is. Pharmacogenomics is how your genetic background influences your response to drugs. So it's basically how your DNA which is what your genome is made out of, influences drug response. So you might not have thought of this, but your response to drugs is actually inherited from your parents and your grandparents, just like your height and your eye color and your disease risk. 
Um, and what we and we, the scientific community, for 30 years have been studying which changes in your DNA have what implications for drugs. Uh, and maybe I'll just give you one quick example. This is not about AI, but it's a good example that you can remember. There is a drug called codeine, which is actually on, in Tylenol number three. So normal Tylenol is acetaminophen. And that's, you know, that's uh, Tylenol. You take it for like a little headache, a little pain. But if you have a little bit more pain than Tylenol can handle, your dentist or your minor surgeon, the surgeon is not minor, but the surgery that they do is minor, <laughs> might give you Tylenol number three, which has some codeine in it. So codeine is actually an inactive molecule. If, you could, if I gave you IV codeine, you would have no effect, except that there is a gene, there's a, a protein, actually a protein like that, whose structure we know from experimental, in your liver that turns codeine into morphine. And morphine is an opioid that relieves pain. So uh, codeine inactive, this enzyme has a terrible name, let's just call it CYP. Um, CYP enzyme, which is, in code, which is encoded in your DNA, turns it into morphine. But some people have versions of CYP that don't work on codeine. And so they get codeine and get no, trans, no um, uh, morphine because the, the reaction doesn't happen, and therefore they get no pain relief. So if they're having their tooth pulled, they have two or three really tough days where they're calling the doctor saying it's not working, it's not working, and unless the doctor has thought of this, the doctor doesn't understand what's going on. Um, typical patients, most people, this is why codeine is an approved drug that is sold, um, have a CYP version that will turn codeine into morphine. There are other people who have a super duper version of CYP that actually turns codeine into morphine too quickly. What do I mean too quickly? Well, all the codeine gets turned into morphine in about 20 minutes, which means they get 20 minutes of euphoria. They are the happiest people on the planet. This is an opioid. It makes you, in addition to relieving pain, it makes you extremely happy. Uh, they get 20 minutes of happiness, but this drug is only supposed to take, be taken every six hours, so they get five and a half hours of pain. So they also call their doctor to complain about the drug. So all this variation is because of different DNA in all of those people, some getting no response and no pain relief at all, some people getting a typical response, and some people getting great morphine for a little while, but then nothing after it because it's all used up. We would like to be able to tell that story for every drug on the market. Uh, and so a lot of what I do is data anal analysis of DNA and data analysis of drug response because really it all boils down to understanding all the ways we can respond to drugs. Like in this story just now, I told you about there's one group of patients who get no relief whatsoever. You know, could an AI system find them for me, please? There's another group of patients that get perfectly fine response to codeine, and there's a third group of patients that get this weird great half hour followed by four and a half hours of nothing. So that's where I might use AI for the drug response, and then I might use AI in the DNA to understand what, are, how are those changes in the DNA, which really literally look like spelling errors. Just to be really clear, when we're doing genomic analysis, I might know that the typical person, so this is my three billion basis, so dot, 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 A, T, T, G, C, C, T, A, G, C, T, dot, dot, dot. That could be a segment of the genome that we all share. One person has, instead of a C, has a G here. And if that's in the CYP gene, then that CYP gene might be sufficiently different to cause, to mess up this reaction. So a lot of that analysis is very data intensive and also uses um, AI technologies. So that's a little, and, oh, and by the way, I have a clinic, I'm a doctor. I don't know if they said that. And I'm a doctor and I have a clinic at Stanford where we check the DNA of patients who have been having trouble with their drugs. Uh, typically, there are elderly patients who are on like literally 15 or 20 drugs and they're, they're having all kinds of side effects and I try to help figure out if any of that is a genetic, if there are any genetic reasons and then I give advice to the 
really to the patient's doctor about the different medications that they can use uh, to um, avoid these side effects. Okay. Any questions on that? So someday you will all, you might not come to my clinic, but someday you will all have your DNA measured and your doctors will hopefully be using it to choose drugs that work best for you and minimize side effects. That is not here yet, except for the people who come to my clinic and a few other clinics around the country that are kind of prototyping this. Okay. So now I want to tell you a little story in each of these three areas. Um, to give you a feeling for the kinds of things that are going on. And again, I I'll stop apologizing, but you may have heard some of these types of applications from the previous speakers. Um, the first one I want to tell you about is um, the EHR and claims. Uh, so this will, well, let's go, we'll go right to left, left to right. And what I want to tell you here is an exciting project in the UK called the UK United Kingdom Biobank. This is a group of 500,000 people who have volunteered to be followed as part of a, a longitudinal study uh, basically until they die in England. And the goal is to learn about the risks of disease and the best treatments by having a group of people that it's not just a snapshot of data, but you follow them over time so you can understand how disease um, evolves over time how drug response um, works or doesn't work for these folks. So it's 500,000 people, and they have all had um, their DNA checked. So they, we have their DNA information. So we have their genomic information. We also have their medical records check, And we have their self-report of diseases that they have. By the way, the medical records are mostly hospital right now, but they're also going to have in, uh, outpatient. So hospital is called inpatient, and when you're in a clinic, it's outpatient because you're outside of the hospital. Okay. Uh, and it's extremely exciting resource because they make all of this data available to anybody, to everybody and anybody freely. There's a little process for a, a requesting access, and you have to sign some documents that you won't try to re-identify who these people are and bother them. But as long as you have fairly legitimate goals, this is an amazing data set of half a million people with their genetics and with their medical records, and it's mostly for discovery. So they have recently, and um, so I want to tell you about one example thing that we're trying to, that we're doing with them that may someday lead to implementation. Here's their problem. Uh, and in fact, I was recently in London, um, I'm kind of an advisor to this group, and they said, we, we have this great resource, but we want, people are saying, give me all the people you have who have diabetes. And I said, well, that should be pretty easy. And they say, no, because for whatever reason, many of the medical records, even though they're on diabetes drugs, and they get diabetes tests, and they see diabetes specialists, it never actually says patient has diabetes. They're not labeled explicitly with diabetes. And self-report, some of them report diabetes, but some of them don't. And, and, so, and in DNA, some of them have clear DNA that is a risk factor for diabetes. But and we all found this shocking. And in fact, they said, we have a list of, let's say it's 500 diseases that we would like for them to be able to, for users to say, give me all your patients with diabetes, because I want to do a study on a subset of them that have diabetes. I want to follow the development of diabetes over time, or response to treatment, or whatever. And then they have inflammatory bowel disease, and depression, and schizophrenia, and um, 496 other diseases that they know exist, they know these patients have, but the mapping isn't there. So one of the ways to do this is using AI technologies, and we're actually going to have a hackathon to, uh, to do this for them, because we said this should be possible. The, why? Here's the key idea. I said there was a lot of circumstantial evidence in the medical record and in the DNA and in the self-report, but it never actually said it. So we're going to do a really stupid, simple thing. Get a few patients. So the input is a few patients who definitely have the disease. 
This is like our training set. We definitely have disease. Then we're going to try to develop metrics, probably iteratively, for uh, a function that takes two patients, patient one and patient two, and gives us a similarity measure. And this can be done using lots of machine learning techniques. Uh, uh, I'm not going to go into the technical details, but if you're familiar with, you can do this with logistic regression, but you can also do this with support vector machines, and you can do this with deep learning. And a lot of people are interested in using the deep learning because it's been so effective in so many other settings, but we'll, we'll try all of the above. If you can get the similarities of these two patients, then you can cluster patients who are similar. And in, in particular, you can take the few patients who definitely have disease. So now let's draw a picture. Let's imagine we have this multi-dimensional space, but I'm only draw it in three dimensions because that's as much as I can go to the board. And here we have a patient who definitely has diabetes, diabetes mellitus, DM. Here's a patient who definitely has schizophrenia. Maybe there's two of them. If our similarity metric is good, and if our deep learning is good, we might be able to get these to be in this, close to each other in some high dimensional space. Schizophrenia, depression, um, hypertension, high blood pressure. So these are our patients that we know. So that's pretty easy, because there what they can do is they can manually look for people who self-reported diabetes, see if their medical records have them on diabetes medications. They can manually do this and say, yeah, I think that person has diabetes. Then, and this is not going to be a surprise to those of you who are like CS types, we can take all the other 490,000 patients and plot them in this space. So I'm doing this in purple. But the key thing is that I can draw a little ball around schizophrenia and say those people are highly likely to be schizophrenic because they have a lot of features in common. They have a high similarity metric. Um, these folks probably are depressed. These people have high blood pressure. These people have diabetes. And we, maybe we don't know for some of these people. This is actually the most interesting to me because this is either noise, likely noise, or it's an unrecognized disease state that uh, is not quite schizophrenia and not quite depression, but somewhere in between that might be actually a useful thing to know. Question. Is not labeled by diagnosis? No. The, the question is, the, the, the data is, well, he, he said with incredulity, the data is not labeled with diagnosis, and the answer is no. Because if they had that, they would just say, we, fine, just do a query on and diabetes. So the UK hospital or medical records don't have diagnosis? As of right now, in the UK biobank, that's correct. They have ways that they think they might get in the future, but they needed a quick and dirty today, and that's when I said, the miracle of AI can do this for you. So, again, I haven't gotten into technical details. It's actually a very complex technical problem because you have a lot of features here. You have to figure out which ones to use. For those of you who do know a little bit about computer science, we're probably looking at some kind of embedding or auto-encoding of the records. But there is a temporal aspect. It changes over time. So you have to figure out how to represent the time aspect. So it's not trivial, but it should be doable. Why do I tell you about it? Yes, this is just for the UK Biobank, and it's just because they need a way to support this. But this is actually how we might be practicing medicine in the future. Because imagine now, forget about the UK Biobank. I already said, we have your electronic health record as well. So what happens if in the future, your doctor, when you come into the office, does a quick search to find, maybe it's a global search, maybe it's a search of all of the US, maybe it's a search of all of California, to say, get me all the patients like this patient who's in front of me, and that are similar. And then I want to see um, graphs of what happened to them from now, to, as I'm seeing this patient, forward. So it can actually be a predictive medicine where it says, well, patients like this, I found 10,000 patients like the patient who's sitting in front of you who are in the same age range. And in the next 10 years, here's the diseases they got, here's the drugs that they took. Right away, you can have a model for what might happen to you based on the data available from everybody else. Question? They also get even more when they're not like, the same biobank is like, accessible or like, high risk for diabetes then. 
Great question. So one of the things that might happen is, let's say there are DNA features that are correlated with the occurrence of diabetes, and maybe the diabetes has not manifest in that patient yet, and so then you might label them as diabetic where they don't even have a clinical diagnosis of diabetes, and so you could imagine that would happen here for sure, and then we would have to fully disclose that to the researchers that you know this is a machine learning algorithm, and it's probably going to pick people who have diabetes or people who have a high risk of getting diabetes, <coughs> and that could be either a plus or a minus depending on what their what their research questions are. So the reason I tell this story is it's a little thing right now for UK Biobank, but it may be the future of how we figure out personalized prognosis for for patients by looking at cohorts that are chosen especially for them, uh, and then looking at the future, at, at how those cohorts evolved over time, and, and what happened. So that's my first story. I think we're okay on time, right? Because I can tell another story at least. Good. So let me tell you um, the genomic story. I'll tell that sh quickly, short, short story. But we'll tell it in the color we haven't used, green. This is a little bit, this might not be, let's see how this goes. I want to talk a little bit more about this idea that we all have different DNA and it might influence things like drug response. So this is a problem. And let me make the problem very clear. In DNA variation, you can generally break it up into common variation and rare variation. Common variation are DNA changes that are found in a large fraction of the human population. Like, even 1% of the, I mean, there's, what is there, like 11 billion people on Earth? So if there's a DNA variation that occurs in 1%, then 1% 11, 1 of 11 billion is still plenty of people where you can do statistics, where you can say, okay, I want to find 1,000 people with this variation and 1,000 without this variation, and I want to see how they differ in their health, or in how they look, or whatever. You can do genetic studies to discover. So this common variation is present enough that you can do statistical association studies. And lots of genetics up until now have been based on common variation. And some variation uh, is up to half the population has it, and then 10, and then 5, and then 1. But at some point, and the, the definition of rare is a little bit is a little bit loosey-goosey, but I can tell you some things that are uncontroversial. Everybody in this room has a change in their DNA that is unique to them. So even though mom and dad gave you a genome, during that whole sperm and egg thing, I'm not going to go into details, some of the DNA got messed up, and you have about, I think the current estimates, a hundred typos in your six billion bases from mom and dad, right? So mom gave you three billion, Dad gave you three billion. There are a hundred places where the copy that Mom and gave you was slightly corrupted, okay? And your DNA is different. Now, the good news is it's mostly okay because you're all sitting here, you're listening to a fascinating lecture, you're engrossed, no problem. But some of those changes could affect things in the future. There might be some change in your disease risks due to that. Or what I care about, it may mess up your coding dose. So, um, and I'm never going to be able to study those hundred mutations in you using statistics because you're the only one in the world who has that mutation. So what the heck am I going to do? And this is the second area I want to talk about how AI is providing tools for us to understand this. And I'm going to give a, I'm going to give a high level description of how we're, how we're doing it. So first of all, the common variation, we, we can study it statistically, but it also gives us examples of how a variation can affect health. And so we kind of want to generalize from multiple examples to learn the principles, this is kind of obvious, but I want to write it, the principles uh, by which mutations in the DNA affect biological function. So what we're doing, 
just, just to describe the project in a little bit more detail, and then I'll get to my final example, uh, and then we'll be done. Uh, what we're doing is we're taking the DNA for some, for actually for this gene, the same gene that I talked about, where that's what this project is on, and I'm going to use little dots for where humans have mutations. So here's a common one, and here's a common one. So I say they're common because I have six humans here, and three of them have this got three of them have this mutation, and, I, and this one is common, same deal, three out of six. But this I've only seen once. That's I've only seen once. This I've seen once. But we have this information not only for our CYP gene, but there are twenty thousand other genes in the human genome where we have similar information. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at these these common variations and the common variations dot, 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 in all of these 20,000. And we're going to do something that you may have heard about called transfer learning. So transfer learning is a pretty hot area right now in AI. And the idea is that you train a system to do well on one task, but then you use what it's learned on a new, harder task. So there's an easy or doable task, and then there's a harder, not yet done task. So what we're going to do is we're going to train um, an AI system to predict these common ones that we know the answer, because we've done statistical associations, and we know that they mess up biology in a certain way. And we have thousands, even millions of them. They're all common, so it's not interesting, because we already know the answer. But we can have the AI system learn how to re-predict those same things using only information about the sequence. Once we do that, we can then take it and we can let it loose on these rare guys with some hope that what it learned on the common variations, it can transfer to the rare setting. And there's reasons why this could work. There's also reasons why it might not work. But right now, it's our best guess. It's our best effort because we're never going to be able to study all of you and your 100 unique variants, but we might be able to build an algorithm that says, okay, we found your 100 variants because we sequenced your DNA, which is cheap. We're going to be able to do that. We found your 100 variants, and many, and many others as well, but let's focus. This is, what I was, uh, this is what I brought up. We're going to look at those 100, run them through, and say, do these 100 variants have any of the features that, are, that common variants have that make common variants troublesome? cause disease, mess up drug response, all of the things we might care about for health. And so that's an ongoing project. I just wanted to mention how the transfer learning is a way sometimes to solve such problems by solving a problem you know the answer to and then applying it to a new, to a new set of data. And then I want to give you one more example and then I'm going to stop. And the last one is environmental Sensing, and you might think this is a little bit of a stretch, but it's a fun project, so I'm going to tell you about it anyway. Um, we are in, interested in discovering drug side effects. So we want to associate drugs with, we call them AEs, adverse events. It's a terrible name. So the idea is there are drugs, and they're supposed to work, and you take them. But every now and then you take a drug, and like you vomit. That happens a lot, actually. Or you take a drug, and it causes a terrible rash. And there's a lot of things that drugs can do that they're not intended to do. And it's very important to have those chronicled, both so that doctors can use that information when they're making decisions about what drugs can use for you, um, and also so they can avoid them. Uh, and also so we can understand exactly how that drug works. Why is that drug causing a rash? That is not something we knew before. We can study that to try to learn in a better way how that drug works. And there's a long literature that I'm not going to tell you about of people doing this like in the lab uh, with, uh, with mice, with rabbits, with pigs, sometimes with humans where you, not in the lab setting, you don't, you don't grind them up. But we might give a bunch of humans a drug, and we might notice that 20% of them get a rash, and then we write a paper saying, this drug causes a rash in 20% of the patients. But we do not believe that we know all of these adverse events. And we actually believe that patients are experiencing a lot of adverse events that never get captured by the healthcare system. So my student decided to go to the source of all medical knowledge, Reddit. 
<laughs> so you guys don't know what Reddit is. It's like um, this uh, a bunch of discussions that are in a tree based on different topics, and I can assure you there are a zillion health-related Reddits. Health, it's like, you know, our drugs, our health, and it just goes on and on and on. And we are going to look for people who are talking about drugs and people who are talking about adverse events. And when they're talking about both of them, we might be able to make a connection, especially if it's in the same Reddit post. I took this drug and it made me vomit. So what they might say is I took a Tenolol and it made me vomit. But what they might also say is I took this little red pill and it made me barf. And so there's a huge, pro so we're very excited that there's a lot of data on Reddit. The thing that we're worried about is regular humans do not use technical terminology that doctors use. So we have this big terminology problem. So what Adam has done is very similar to this. So in this example, I had a bunch of patients with diseases, and I plotted, I represented them in some kind of representation for the computer. And then when I plotted them, I found that similar patients with similar diseases with, were near each other. My student did a very similar thing with terminology. And some of you may have heard of this tool called word to vec It's a commonly used tool that takes words and maps them to vectors. And it turns out that there's some magic to how you can do this well or not well. And he figured out a lot of the magic. And he figured out a way to create a space that's going to be exactly the same drawing. There's your three-dimensional, but really very high-dimensional space. Here he has the word vomit. Why did I choose vomit? Let's just, let's stick with vomit. Here he has the word vomit, the official word in the official medical terminology. And now here he has migraine headache. But then, when he takes all of the words in red and plots them based on, oh, by the way, I should have said, word to vec looks at a word in a sentence and determines what it means by looking at the plus or minus, let's say, 10 words to the left and to the right. So this is minus 10 words, there's 10 of them, plus 10 words, the 20 words that are surrounding this word. And the idea is, if you're a synonym of W, you will occur with similar words to the left and right, even if you're not a, super, a match to that word itself. And so what he does is he takes these official words, he goes into Reddit, he, word, he builds these word to vec models of the words, you plot all the words, you get the idea, this is exactly what I did before, and all of these words, and it's a little bit more complex than this, but for the purpose of the discussion, all of the purple words that are sufficiently close to the word vomit are synonyms for vomit that are used by regular people in Reddit. And he, I'm not proving this to you, but he has now shown that he had, does a really good job of finding uh, both um, side effects and also drug names. So, uh, in fact, interestingly, there's a lot of slang in drug names and especially there's a lot of slang in drugs that are drugs of abuse. So what he recently did is he looked at opioids, including codeine, but including heroin, fentanyl, Vicodin, all the things that are killing, literally killing tens of thousands of Americans a year. And he built word lists of all the slang for each of these official words. So for example, the word heroin. So heroin is an opioid, it's a narcotic. It's a very, very strong version of morphine. It is illegal, and he found 180 synonyms for heroin. Like, I'm sorry, I don't know the heroin world, and so I can't tell you what they are. <laughs> but I've seen the graph of the paper that he's writing. And he also found, you know, for codeine and for others. So we have the ability to find the mention of the drugs. We have the ability to find all these using these AI kind of deep learning methods. We find the words for the adverse events. And now we can start counting what's the occurrence of a certain of heroin occurring with certain side effects. And then we can start making hypotheses about new associations that the docs missed. The final thing I'll say before we stop for questions is he's a really smart guy. So if you're posting on Reddit Health, 
There's no geolocation data. We don't know where you are in the world or in the country. It just says like, hey dudes, I took some heroin and I had a bad trip. I don't know if anybody said that, but they could say that. <laughs> but you do get the, the handle of the user. Like my handle would be like, Rustdoc, right? So you see, oh, Rustdoc said, hey, I had heroin and I had vomit or whatever, right? It's not geolocated. But guess what? I might use Reddit for something else. So he went into the Reddit corpus and found all the handles that posted about opioids and also found other posts in the, well, r slash San Francisco is one of the subreddits. So he made the assumption, and it's an assumption, it might be noisy, of course, that anybody who posted on r San Francisco may be from San Francisco. It's a big assumption, but at least it enables him to associate Rustock with San Francisco, and now he can build maps of the United States. I don't know if that's the United States. And he can plot the occurrence of different opioid slang words onto this map, and he can look at the development of slang over time, like they never said heroin in this portion of the Midwest until 2016, and then since 2016, it's, and this is actually true because in the Midwest our area, there are pockets of great um, opioid um, addiction and abuse, and he's been able to find these pockets where he did this mapping to geolocations and then plotted heroin use, her, the use of the word heroin uh, in those geolocations and just basically showed a cartoon which confirms the, um, the epidemic. So now what we're trying to do is actually make discoveries that are novel and not just reproduce what's already going on. So let me stop there because I've gone a little bit long, but the theme, remember, was these amazing streams. I told you about each of the streams alone, but the real frontier is combining these streams, integrating them to get signals for disease, for drug treatment, for health, that we can then, after we discover them, move them to implementation. So let me stop there and we can have some questions and conversation. Thanks. Oh, there's a magic word for attendance. Yes. In the UK biobank example, you mentioned like having almost like a vector space for the different right. patients. Um, what do the dimensions represent? So you can often start out with a very sparse made vector that's literally each of the features, like what's their height, what's their weight, what's their glucose, what are they, are they and then a bunch of binary ones for, are they on this drug or not, are they on this drug or not. But the, 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 the use of the AI technologies is to take those vectors and to compress them into much shorter vectors where the, each individual thing does not represent just one. It's like a complex functional combination of those higher level things. So we would take Typically, they'll have like say 3,000 or 5,000 dimensions, yeah. and we'll want to compress it to 100 numbers that allows us to do this 100-dimensional uh, space. And they call it embedded. Yeah. I know that was a little bit of a fire hose. Yes. So is it is this related to the opposition? Yes. So uh, in two ways, the the DNA stuff is exactly how, by doing this and figuring out what your 100 rare variations mean, then I, your doctor, can make decisions knowing exactly how you're going to respond to a drug um, based on an analysis of your DNA. So in your lab, you um, develop a new drug? So we, we are interested in discovering new drugs, and a lot of the technology that I'm talking about, when you combine it, it gives us the ability to actually say, you know what, if we had a drug with the following features, we think it would bind your protein in a special way and would be specifically useful for you. Yeah, so that's one of the goals. And that, by the way, this news today, um, the 3D structure of a protein is incredibly important for predicting uh, whether a drug will bind it. And so this is a huge breakthrough for drug design. That was the end of the quarter. Am I going to be on the final? Is there a final? There's no final. So I'm not on the final. Okay, I can also hang out for a few minutes uh, afterwards if you have uh, special questions. So thanks very much. <laughs>